Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Matthew Hofarth. Today is September 9th, 2021, and I'm speaking with Lucas Rickert, who is Associate Professor and George Erdang Chair in the History of Pharmacy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's the author of Break On Through, Radical Psychiatry and the American Counterculture. Thank you for joining us, Lucas. Hey, thanks. It's a pleasure to talk. Your book describes the era of psychiatry during the late 1960s and 1970s. It was a time of immense social, cultural, and political upheaval. Could you give us some background on the events occurring at that time? Happy to. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation. There's a reason I called the book's first chapter Disruption. There were lots of transformations that occurred in technological and scientific aspects of American life at this time but also uh, in work-life balance uh, and in the family structure uh, and in government and business. And of course, there was the rights revolution and women's liberation that was ongoing. I have to, uh, of course, underline the Vietnam War, which provided a volatile background for uh, rapidly moving reconstructions of society and culture. And I guess I try to make the case that these developments in all facets of Americans' lives uh, had an impact on mental health, on psychiatry and the practice of psychiatry. And so the disruption chapter starts off with an anecdote from a 1969 meeting which featured uh, Claude Steiner, who was one of the eventual founders of radical psychiatry, and his mentor, Eric Byrne, who was the founder of Transactional Analysis, and they're in Burns House, and a bunch of other therapists met uh, weekly to discuss valuable cases, but they also met to drink and to dance, and they're mixing work and play. And anyway, based on these recordings, that night they were quarreling about how to stay focused on how to stay neutral and to stay quote-unquote scientific. Uh, Byrne wanted to be civil and straightforward, whereas Steiner was getting pretty political and pretty loud. And Steiner, according to the recordings that I used for the book, um, says there's going to be one confrontation, one situation after another, and changes are going to occur. And and he was right. And, And that's sort of the beginning of the book. Your book focuses on the intersection of the counterculture and psychiatry in the late 1960s and 1970s. As you say in the introduction, the period of the 1970s was a shakeout moment in which radical ideas either matured, faded away, or became mainstream. Could you tell us more about how the 1970s changed American psychiatry and mental health, and why? It's a good question. Uh, There were several intersecting developments that I touch on and blend together in the course of the book. One is the gradual decline of Freudianism as an underlying approach in mental health therapy. And this paradigm or icon, as Joel Paris has uh, suggested, gave way uh, slowly to new evidence-based approaches in the 1960s and afterwards. And so you have significant debate taking place over psychiatric nosology, which is the classification of illnesses, over uh, scientific legitimacy and the value of evidence-based diagnoses. So you're having this debate focusing essentially on if you will, forces of modernization, psychopharmacology, deinstitutionalization, and social uh, psychiatry. I suppose just to pause for a second, I'd recommend to uh, anyone listening to maybe read uh, Anne Harrington's recent book about biopsychiatry specifically to get uh, a sense of how, as Freudianism gave way, you see this uptick in biological approaches Uh, But Matthew, I guess another development that I just wanted to uh, underscore for listeners would be maybe the establishment and widespread acceptance of Abraham Maslow's humanistic psychology. Uh, And maybe another example related to that, how business administration programs and business schools at places like MIT and Harvard and UCLA latched on to and helped popularize his ideas. So there were, uh, as I put it in the book, sort of churning cross currents and different influences 
on psychiatry that were coming from the counterculture, but also, also within the medical uh, realm as well. So it occurs to me that uh, there were a lot of new entrants into the uh, medical marketplace and mental health therapies and mental health philosophies began to diverge and split and you began to see more and more offerings that catered to greater demand in the uh, American medical marketplace. The 1970s saw progressives and radicals attempt to change the psychiatric and psychological disciplines from both inside and out. Some of the more prominent groups that you write about are the Radical Caucus within the American Psychiatric Association, the Medical Committee for Human Rights, and the Student Medical Conference. Could you talk about these groups a bit more, how they tried to reform the psychiatric discipline, and how successful they were? I, I remember first becoming intrigued by medical activists when reading Naomi Rogers' work. It was, I think, back in 2008 or 2009, and I, I decided that this was something I wanted to pursue as, uh, as a struggling graduate student and then a uh, struggling postdoc. And I continued on uh, trying to unpack these, these groups that you mentioned, um, the Radical Caucus most concretely, as I became part of the academic precariat later on. But not meaning to get off track, I, I suppose I wanted to get a handle on these groups that got involved in societal problems uh, because I was recognizing that there were some similarities in, in contemporary society, whether or not that was structural racism or climate issues or, or what have you. And, you know, I was really intrigued to learn about the various factions and groups within the uh, American Psychiatric Association, for example, which you mentioned. And one was the Radical Caucus. The Radical Caucus, you know, had its genesis in the late 1960s. And I wrote about that group specifically back in 2013 now uh, in Social History of Medicine. Uh, and I was writing about this while I was still on the job hunt. And along with this Radical Caucus, um, which I had first learned about while reading uh, Michael Staub's Madness and Civilization, was that its members had really robust beliefs around militarism in the United States. They, they really felt strongly about racial hierarchies in medical fields, but society more generally, generally and wanted to help take apart these hierarchies or at least critically evaluate these hierarchies. And not only for patients, but also for wider society. You know, and these, these members in the Radical Caucus also had started out sometimes in uh, the Student Medical Conference or in the Medical Committee for Human Rights. Uh, sometimes they had taken part in protests in the 1960s. Uh, sometimes they were actually carrying placards. Other times members um, were acting as uh, first responders uh, to people who were out on the front lines and who had been injured. So in a way, these, uh, you know, these groups, uh, they aligned with what you might call the, the social psychiatry approach, which my colleague Matt Smith uh, at the University of Strathclyde is writing about at this stage. And essentially social psychiatry was a stream of mental health practice that believed that you needed to focus in a more broader, holistic way uh, about what caused mental illness and then how to address mental illness. So it wasn't just about faults or traits or genes. Uh, it was indeed more about sickness that was rooted in a political or social system and that might be sexism or racism or inequality. And for a lot of uh, radicals, the alienation caused uh, by these systems were indeed the, the, the biggest problem to address. If I had to take a stab at your, your the end bit of your question though, Matthew, about success, I think that they were successful in popularizing ideas, uh, even for a short period of time, 
about uh, the need to take a, a broader approach to dealing with mental illness. Obviously, MDMA and LSD before it had an important role to play in psychiatry and in helping to facilitate clinical interventions. Could you say more about how MDMA was used by psychiatrists and clinicians and why it went from being something of a wonder drug to then being banned? MDMA, uh, it's such a complicated story about how it was used and then how it was made to go away. So just so listeners uh, know, I, I devote a, one chapter of the book to substances through the lens of mental health and MDMA along with uh, LSD and cannabis form part of that chapter. MDMA is particularly interesting to me. Uh, it's uh, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, uh, just so everyone knows, and the methamphetamine part of that is important. So this is a drug that's also known as ecstasy. If people don't know, it's gone by other names, molly, sometimes considered a love drug. But, you know, it was first synthesized in 1912 or 1913, I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head, but it was by Merck, the, the German pharmaceutical giant. And, you know, MDMA in a clinical setting facilitates a state of mind that is conducive to conversation. And it was used for counseling purposes for a variety of uh, reasons. And for its supporters in the 1970s, just like today, MDMA uh, opened people up. It led to honesty. It led to breakthroughs. It's kind of one of the reasons why I called the book Break On Through. Now, I mean, it's being used, and now I mean like right now in 2021, it's being used to treat individuals who are suffering through post-traumatic stress disorder. And experts have uh, essentially predicted that we could see this uh, drug approved by 2023, 2024, and it'll be in the medical marketplace. What's intriguing looking back is that PTSD, the diagnosis, has its roots in the Vietnam War and how mental health practitioners, psychiatrists, psychologists had to deal with a landslide or onslaught of people coming back from, from Southeast Asia, suffering grief and loss and recurring nightmares. And what we've seen is a slow uptick in the number of diagnoses of PTSD since then, but no treatment uh, that has been uh, as effective as mental health pac uh, practitioners and patients would like. And so what we're seeing is MDMA joining with uh, PTSD, the diagnosis. So that's super intriguing to me uh, is that it's back and, and big time back. Uh, you can look in the pages of Nature uh, and see all the articles in the New York Times and elsewhere. You can see that companies are spending a lot of money on this. The drug has gotten support from government regulators and, and investors. And, you know, why exactly it went from something of a wonder drug to being banned to, to address your to your question head on is there wasn't enough available data at the time. There wasn't enough evidence to support the use. You did have uh, anecdotal reports coming from high profile uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who indeed uh, were testifying before Congress and making the case, uh, I think very compellingly looking back that MDMA should be used but ultimately uh, the political winds and the stigma associated uh, with different uh, substances led to uh, its banning. So that, you know, arguably was a missed opportunity. After reading your book, I was struck by how many developments in psychiatry in the 1970s, whether it be the use of psychedelic drugs, the focus on the self and self-development, or the rise of progressive interest groups highlighting racism and sexism in the field, seemed to wane in the latter part of the 20th century, only to have come back in force in the last few years or so. Would it be fair to say that we are now re-experiencing the 1970s in some way? And if so, what lessons might we learn today from the successes and pitfalls of that earlier era? Good questions. 
But yeah, I mean, I think there is likely something to that idea about re-experiencing elements of the 1970s. You are touching on something there, and it bears more reflection. I guess I've been struck by some of the similarities, and I already mentioned earlier that uh, I'm feeling a, a bit of deja vu now, uh, having written about some of these elements, whether or not it's racism or inequal other inequalities, um, that we're that we're going through now, my protagonists were disenchanted with with all sorts of problems in the country, and with violence in particular, particularly uh, Vietnam War. They were unhappy with how women were treated, and so you know I, I'd have to reflect more on that whether or not we're experiencing or re-experiencing the '70s, or whether or not we're just feeling aftershocks. Uh, I'm not sure what the appropriate terminology uh, is, but yeah, I, I, I do feel like there are, um, there are parallels. You know, as for lessons, uh, I sometimes return to a 1977 interview uh, with uh, Michel Foucault, where he wondered whether psychiatry was not on good terms with its own history. Uh, I can take or leave Foucault, mostly leave, but I think that he was he was right to ask the question about reckoning um, with with history, and I, I can't help but wonder if we are on good terms with our recent history, and and I guess more specifically the elements that drove my my protagonists, the protagonists in the Radical Caucus. Some of the other protagonists in the book that I touch on include Alexander Shulgin, uh, Phyllis Chesler from the American Psychological Association, uh, Judy Chamberlain, a patient activist, Artie Lang, a psychiatrist from Scotland who was highly influential in the United States. You know, these uh, protagonists and activists all were struggling with um, what was going on. And, you know, as we sort of contemplate our own recent history in 2021, we, we should be thinking what it is informing uh, how we write our history and what kind of lessons we can draw from the 1970s and elsewhere. I mean, what kind of scholars do we want to be? I don't want to get on too much of a high horse or anything, but a lot of Americans are dealing with massive divides with wealth. There's a huge gap between rich and poor. I mean, wars in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan, you know, whether or not you supported them or not, have left uh, gaping psychological and fiscal wounds on this country. And so, you know, mental health continues to be an intractable problem for uh people across all population groups and and policymakers, practitioners, and I think historians need to reckon with this. Uh, and so just as in the 70s, where we're struggling with poverty, racism, colonialism, and this, this helped create mental health problems back then, so this persists in the present. So that's, that's one thing. One sort of downer lesson I would bring forward for you, Matthew, but uh, one maybe more optimistic lesson is that I'm seeing a lot of uh, change in the mental health field right now. I'm seeing more and more money and um, resources uh, being devoted to studying different types of substances uh, that will complement existing treatments already uh, that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. So I see um, in the next few years that we could have uh, novel new drugs on the market uh, that could help people. The book is Break On Through, Radical Psychiatry and the American Counterculture from MIT Press. Thank you, Lucas, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. It was really a pleasure. Thanks. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You can find more resources for exploring this topic, other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect with our community of scholars at 
chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.